Mr. Dustin Caro. How are we, sir? Doing quite well these days. Uh, down in Arizona, it's a little time away from the freezing cold of Colorado. And a lot, a lot going on in the uranium nuclear fuel side, as you know. So, very interesting I, I, time. That's why I'm calling. Yes. That's why I'm calling. Yep. Look, I mean, I think since we last, but I mean, the last interview, I think, we had a really fantastic reaction. It was, you know, of the moment. It was a great time in the uranium market, great expectations. But since that, we've had what I've called a pregnant pause in the uranium price. People are a little bit unsure what to think. What's causing that? What do you What do you think? We, we, we Where can we lay the blame? Well, Matt, as you well know, the spot market in uranium is um, certainly not the major platform for utilities and producers. If you look back 10, 15 years, the traders, the financial entities really are the major actors in the market. So you have to look at it kind of in that perspective. And yeah, we had a very, very strong run up on, on reduced volume. So the economist in me says, well, what you're seeing is, you know, demand is outpacing the available supply. And, and I think this goes back to the UX announcement of, of September of 22, that, you know, the, the era of excess inventory is over. I don't want to get into the specifics, but it's kind of interesting. You know, there was two billion pounds produced before the commercial nuclear industry started its uh, its presence. And so the industry, the, the markets always had that somewhere. Price goes up, inventory comes from somewhere, and the price tends to go down. Um, but what we're seeing now is finally, after the crossover in 90, when consumption exceeded production, we now have, let's call it a more balanced market moving into a seller's market. And so, you know, the the events of late February were volatility on the downside. When I was told it was a trader came in the market, very small volume, 100,000 pounds, and they offered it $7 below the per posted price. That set the market. So then everybody started scrambling around. And, uh, you know, we're still at pretty minimal volumes. And if you look at what UX has reported for the first two months, it's below what we saw last year, which was below, you know, the year before. So I think we're going to move into a phase when spot is going to get smaller and smaller. I don't see the uh, co sequestering funds coming in and buying up big volumes. I mean, as you know, at one point, Sprott was buying a million pounds a week. And the word is, it's just not there. I mean, you might, you might want to buy it, but it, it's not available. So we're in a very interesting time for the spot market. And I think to some degree, unfortunately, everybody watches that price. So when it weakens, they jump out of the equities, they you know, they, the, the utilities, some of them might step back from term contracting saying, well, I need to see where how far this is going to go down. What does it mean on supply? So, you know, it's, it's one of those phases of the market, but I just don't see it as being, you know, it doesn't have long legs. I think we'll see a turnaround fairly soon, but we're right now, I guess I saw this morning prices just below 90 you know, 88, I think, is what the average was. So, you know, we're seeing that weakening. We are seeing it weakening. But I, but I think it, it, I was talking to John Bagley last night, which I'm trying to, again, trying to understand what the moving part He's coming up from a slightly different angle from, you know, the way, where we will today. But we remind ourselves, it's it's such a small market. It's such a small space, Uranium. It's, it's a tiny little space. And a few movers, good or bad, can change the, the 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 price. It can change the sentiment very, very, very quickly. You know, um, so I think this kind of in this pregnant pause of ours, that 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 trader story, I've, I've heard, I've heard similar. I think you know, we've probably maybe even heard from which part of the world um, that they're from. Um, and you know, we all have different needs, right? Yeah. So, so one hundred thousand pounds can dramatically change price and sentiment as a result here. But I think we needed a breather. I felt we've been running yeah. quite quickly up to 106 bucks. It's it's not 
sustainable at those speeds. So I think what we need to see, and I don't know if you agree, is sustained but manageable movement in that price because the demand is there, supply is not there. So I think the fundamentals stack up. But I, I, it makes me a bit nervous that what, what happened before Christmas and, and, and into this year. Yeah, I think we we saw, again, a classic period where it got a bit overheated, no question. Uh, but if you look at the term price, that's been moving up in a much more measured manner. Let's call it that. You know, it's up to now 75. I don't think there's a lot of pounds available at that level. So I think we'll be moving into the 80s on, a, uh, you know, maybe not tomorrow. But I think certainly uh, not too uh, too late in the year, could be before the middle of the year. And then that brings more developers to the table that are being cautious, most of them. You know, we have, we're in the restart phase of the market, which we talked about before, which we always saw coming, that as the price got to a sufficient level, you would see – you know, the, the paladins and the lotuses and the bosses and the encores and, you know, the list. But the the total production from all of that is not that dramatic. Let's put it that way. I just added it up this morning. And if you ignore MacArthur, which is a separate, I, I always saw as a separate story in the restarts. And it's about 20, 22 million pounds if they all come on to the levels that they say that they want to reach. Now, it's not trivial, but we're short a lot more than that as you get a little later in this decade. But but it's interesting, Matt, because I, what I'm saying, that phase of the market is delaying the true, let's call it true new developments. Yeah, we've got DASA in Niger eventually produced three million pounds, three and a half, um, seem to be making progress. The situation there seems to be clarifying a bit, you know. But other than that, there's been no, because I, I hear, well, why weren't there a bunch of new developments announced when the spot price got to 100? That was never going to happen. You know, it's got to, you've got to say, well, no, it's going to be backed up by term contracts that are at enough, high enough price level to support the, uh, you know, in some cases, billion dollars or more investment in these projects that take years. Even when you get the money in the door, you're still years away from production. So I think, you know, as we've talked, the fundamentals are getting stronger. I mean, we just had the Wood McKinsey study come out on SMRs. They see you know, 22 gigawatts of SMR capacity kind of now on the table. And they think to double by 2050, 30% of that uplift has to be SMRs. But they point out uranium. You know, we've got to have a much more robust uranium sector. So, uh, so I mean, it, it's, and, and, you know, we won't get into Turkey looking at another set of reactors, the Philippines, I mean, it really is mind-boggling on the demand side. Will all of them do that? Maybe not. But the mere fact that they're looking seriously at the government level at these projects, these nuclear projects, it's just like I've I've said recently, um, I've never seen this before. And I've been around a very long time, really almost since the start of the commercial uh, sector, and to have the kind of demand picture that we're seeing is is overwhelming, but it's not yet translating into supply across the fuel cycle. So, no, I mean your 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 point about you know okay, twenty two million pounds you know from the new the current um, group of developers who potentially could could get a it's not a whole bunch of beans, quite frankly, you know, and, I, and again. I think another day we'll have a conversation about you know new technologies coming in because if 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 nuclear doesn't get its act together and supply doesn't get its act together to supply into that energy demand it's not nuclear demand per se it's yeah, energy yeah. demand uh, right that's what we need to remember people will design that out of their their plans so we 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 do as a sector need to get get on top of it and and I want to come back to the fundamentals bit but your your comment about you know some of 
the behaviors we're seeing in the sector, such as um, you know, equities have come off a bit as prices come off a bit. The Aussies got spanked about 25%, you know, two, three weeks ago. And that'll be a certain type of investor taking profits off of the table. And that's fine. That's the name of the game. You got it, you're here to make money, right? But, you know, maybe they're looking at resurgence of gold and redeploy their capital and that money won't come back into the space. But what we need is a kind of like a good sort of solid, and I think again from what, what Sprott is saying is a good sort of solid institutional um, foundation into the space, obviously into financial products like like Sput, um, but also um, into some of these larger equity uh, positions will be a good thing, and I and I hope that happens this year, but in a in a kind of steady state of of growth. Um, it's like I said, more of that in a, another day. The the point you point I want to talk to you about is um, as an investor, we've seen this rapid rise up. We've seen it come off, and maybe down to traders like dumping stock in the market, and you know, for whatever their own financial reasons. But I've also noticed like mixed messages coming from the likes of Cameco, who may be wondering to you know slow this exuberance down a bit, or maybe it was not deliberate. And also, you know, Kazatomprom mixed messages. Yeah. You know, we we will produce more pairs, we won't produce more pairs. We we can't get. Um, enough acid we, we we can get acid but we don't want to pay so much for that acid. do you know what i mean so i mean how, how do you read these big industry players who really can sort of influence the market how are you reading how they're playing it yeah well certainly first of all on cameco i mean you know i've known them a very long time very reliable they tend to be very conservative they're not out hyping their stock usually and and i thought i thought it was interesting their comment about expanding macarthur that you know, get it, going to get it to the eighteen million. Then we'll start looking at the expansion up to, I believe, the license capacity of twenty-five million. I would have thought they'd done that already. In other words, they would have said, "Okay, here's the plan." But they seem to be again a little more uh, um, conservative on where are they going to take production. They're not talking about developing it in Australia. Uh, I think they're being cautious about Kazakhstan with Inkai. Where is that going? You know, and it's almost now being treated as a secondary source that if they deliver, great. If, you know, there's delivery problems, we can still cover through other sources. So, again, I think, uh, you know, that's what would be what I would have expected. And I think under the Westinghouse uh, acquisition, they're, they're not going to become more, let's call it exuberant. You know, again, reactor vendors tend to be very conservative group, and and I think they will be playing a bigger role in support of Westinghouse. There's no question in my mind, you know, initial cores, reloads, they're going to be the go-to guy, certainly for Westinghouse, if they've got the uranium available. The situation in Kazakhstan, you know, um, I don't claim I have any real inside information, but picking up various sources. Um, I think they're struggling. Clearly, they're starting to, they had been putting the messages out, but it was in that little tiny font down below their tables that, well, if we run into supply chain issues or whatever, then GR guidance could come under pressure, which obviously it has. Um, I heard that apparently in August, they'll be releasing the 2025 guidance. Nobody sees that being a positive announcement. The asset side, yeah, they've now contracted for a new asset plant, and they're saying, oh, end of 26, it could be done. I don't know. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a reagent expert in Central Asia. But the word is they're, they're pretty short on the asset side. I've heard a number... They need 4 million tons of acid, and that's to keep current projects operating, but also to, you know, acidify the the well fields in the two new projects, the big one being Budin Novoskoye, I think, which is supposed to produce over 15 million pounds soon, I think in 26, and then the Arano South Kaduk project. But they're short like a million pounds of acid. 
Now they're saying that it's because the suppliers of the asset are raising prices. They don't want to set a precedence by accepting those prices. It's, it's not clear cut to me kind of what they're doing. But again, being they have striven mightily to be the biggest guy, and now they seem to be having some serious problems. It's transport, you know, the Trans-Caspian route that they said 71% of their Western deliveries went through that last year. I talked to some folks that would know, and they said they didn't see it. So now are they somehow spinning that number some, you know, how did they come up with that? Um, and it's the change in management is starting to make the utilities uncomfortable when you change your senior management every couple of months or every th six months. That doesn't suggest stability. So, you know, the big players um, that they're, they're showing, again, some one being conservative. And yeah, so they're, you know, Cameco, they're short a couple million pounds. I don't see that as a big deal. Uh, but yeah, when, when the Kazakhs are... 9 million pounds from what they thought they would do, that starts to be a meaningful shortage. And there is a school of thought that says they actually need that. That's already committed production because the one project's all going to the Russians anyway, Budendovskoya. So, yeah, the big guys are now, they're not totally at the, the rock-solid foundation of supply. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and obviously for Kazatomprom, the, the, the suppliers in question are, are the Russians yeah. predominantly. So therefore, you've got to wonder what's going on with that relationship. People talk about Kazatomprom and, and perhaps being in, in, in bed with you know the Russians. And obviously, we've talked about the Ch Chinese demand coming in here. That 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 must be mentioned in the same breath. So with, with regards to that whole kind of Eastern block of nuclear um demand that you you know enrich uranium um, production that uranium needs um it, it kind of kind of feels like that's all being tied up in a nice little bow and parked off to the side which is going to cause us you know in the west problems yeah because the enri enrichment at the moment we hear we, people recognize it's an issue we have seen some small moves but it doesn't feel like it's gonna take hold or um, be reliable anytime soon. I mean, are you, are you seeing anything that leads you to be encouraged? Well, the word is, you know, both uh, Yurenko and Arano have announced expansions. Uh, the word on the street is some of that is replacing centrifuges that are finally wearing out. So will they, in fact, do you take their nominal capacity and multiply it by 1.15? Uh, remains to be seen. But yeah, we don't see anybody announcing a big new enrichment plant uh, at all. So I think, again, the fuel supply side is being cautious. You know, Yurenko never, yeah, they always tried to build to answer the demand rather than than build in anticipation. That was always their approach with the modular expansion on the, uh, on the uh, enrichment side. So again, I think the supply sector is being cautious. They've seen some of this before. They've seen prices run up, seen them drop off. And, you know, I mean, it goes back to WNFM two years ago when the supplier said it's up to the buyers. They have to show their long-term commitment at sustainable prices. I don't think we're there yet, or we would have seen more projects. Started to see it more of the juniors announcing, you know, a, pri a, a, a contract here, a contract there. I think the utilities are beginning to, uh, a, you know, accept the the proposed term project or contracts that they weren't really interested in pursuing, even last October, November. Now it's like, well, okay, it looks like I've got to do that seventy two dollar contract or something. So, you know, we're still seeing, I think, those terms strengthening uh, across the board in the term contract side. Extension options and all of that. The other interesting phenomenon that's going on is just the length of the base periods. 
you know, the term contracts used to be four to five years base, two to three year extension option on the side of the buyers. Well, now the buyers are really pushing the dates further out. I mean, we just had a U.S. utility come in the market yesterday. Uh, they want to go out as far as about 33, 34 at least. Uh, the Koreans were in the market late last year, and it was 26 to 30. They did not get the kinds of offers they wanted, so they're coming back in the market for 27 to 36. So I think what they're what we're seeing is, yeah, it's nice to have an option if you're a buyer, but I better lock in this material if I can. So that that'll be the next thing. So yeah, so we're seeing a big, I think, a change in the term contracting side, along with the volumes that are up. But but one thing, just to pa- comment on that, Matt, the U.S. utilities, it's been reported, did about 20 million pounds of new term commitments last year. That's six months of their burn. So they've really backed down from the term contracting. They have, they have. And and, and it kind of feels like to me, we talked, we used an analogy about, you know, picking the prettiest girl at the dance last time around. And, and, and I think what I think what was trying to, and it comes down to a, comment, a conversation you and I've had, which is around, you know, what's going on with all of these conferences and you know meetings yeah. and you know do, do people want speed dating or do they want to settle down and, and it feels like they're kind of getting to that okay i think we need to start thinking about settling down here which is find out who's real who's just talking about it and you know you know he looks good but it, you know can't back it up and um that the utilities themselves are wanting to get into meaningful dialogue shall we say with with companies and there's not a lot of options for them out there. You know, you, we, we, you, you said already that in terms of spot, you know, it's been kind of cleaned out. It's hard, you yeah. know, to, um, again, you know, but they, they bought 40,000 pounds recently, but that they, they can't buy anything anymore right now. Cause they're, you know, the, 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 the NAV situation. So the 63 million pounds bought up was fantastic, but they, they're not the solution to the current problem. It's fundamentals are, Demand, we know, is there. Supply is not performing. So what do we do? Utilities are going to do what? How are they going to play this game? They're reluctant buyers at the moment. What What's going to change? Well, first of all, I think the Europeans, you know, they did the lion's share of term contracting last year. And, and you do bring up an interesting point, Eastern Europe, you know, which had been a, a Russian bastion for years are now turning virtually all of them, except what, Hungary or one of them, um, to the West. And, you know, the Slovaks just came out for 21 million pounds with deliveries as far out as 2039. So, you know, and Cameco has rightly mentioned that, you know, that segment of the market is could be as much as 15 million pounds a year by the time you add up all those utilities. And that's now being layered on the Western suppliers. So it's not just the traditional kind of Western demand. It's that plus Eastern Europe. But yeah, I think, you know, let's, let's focus on the U.S. I mean, it's still the highest degree of uncommitted requirements. Um, they're still trying to deal with. Russian fuel uncertainties. You know, we've had the the ban on Russian fuel passed in the House. The Senate kind of backed off. Looks like they're kind of back on it. They're just having hearings about the impact of Russian nuclear fuel globally. So I, I think they they've they back in twenty two they did quite a bit of term contracting, seventy some million pounds. So I think they'd covered off maybe near-term uncertainties. But you go out now to China, 26, 27 and beyond, their unfilled requirements start to get pretty noticeable. And and I think part of it is the supply they were seeing was noticeably higher priced than what they'd been enjoying for years. Um, so that would made them a bit, a bit hesitant. They didn't want to over-contract. 
you know, do you want to double down? And what if the Russian fuel keeps flowing? But but yeah, this idea of, you know, like going probably the ultimate was Charlotte, the, the conference there in October. And it was a bunch of 20, 30 minute meetings and people were running around from one place to sit to another. And, you know, but I think at some point the utilities will go through that list and they'll say, you know, I really need to focus in on these five or six guys that have the credibility they have, you know, because they are asking me, who's going to do this? In other words, they're, they're kind of starting to drill down. And, and it's not just, oh, a guy that, you know, was a geologist 30 years ago, and now he's got a drill log somewhere in the Colorado Plateau. Um, they're not going to invest a lot of time in that. I think they got to say, you know, particularly the bigger guys have to say, we have to get serious with the larger, credible, long-term supply sources. You know, because this, this doesn't go away if you cover off the next three or four years. You know, you then still have a problem on the supply side. Next gen, you know, we, we're, I think we all know that's a good technical project. That is not going to address the supply problem. As, as Leah said, you need at least two more of these by like the early 30s to even get close. So, you know, you need another 60 million pounds a year. And so then you have to say, well, where? It's not going to come out of the U.S. industry. The U.S. industry is expanding slowly, and it will supply, you know, a nice percentage to the U.S. utilities, but probably not going to come from Kazakhstan. The Uzbeks, you may have seen, the Chinese have just entered an agreement with the Uzbeks. So they're holding hands there with Orano with the Japanese, and there just aren't the resources in Uzbekistan. So again, you look around, yeah, Africa, sure. You know, as you know, I work with Deep Yellow, and Tumas looks really solid at 3.6 million pounds. So that will be a good adder, and, you know, followed by Mulga Rock, hopefully, you know, as we continue to look at the DFS. But the point is you need a lot of these. You know, it's not just one big producer is going to come in and save the day. You've got to be encouraging a whole laundry list of new uranium mine developers soon. It's not like, oh, we can wait till 2035. No. <laughs> so. It's it's funny, isn't it? It's it, it, <laughs> <laughs> make me think of we get the utilities should get a little buying group together, get together, back the good ones, and at least ensure that those can get financed. Because the problem each of these companies has got is the financing, the cost of that financing, because they may have some contracts, but maybe not enough contracts. Certainly, maybe not enough, enough of the at, at, at the right rate. You know, I've, I've been at the other side of it. I've been the banking side of that that, that conversation. It's, you know, there's a lot of proof points needed here and maybe a few of the better ones need to uh, need, need to need to get some support. Now, if that's not because, again, I was talking to other people in the past couple of weeks or so, because I was up in Toronto and the, um, for that, the uranium night, Monday night at the pub, <laughs> uh, the great and the good, Arano, Ar Ar Kamako, yep. comes out some prom, uh, represented there uh, along with lots of other great people like, um, Danison, et cetera. So, you know, and, and the conversation there was like, you know, is it going to reach a stage where governments do have to step up, not just in terms of backing it with, um, you know, obviously with, you know, the, the US or I've, I've put a few papers forward, they've put a bit of money forward, but it's all sort of downstream stuff. And you're like, well, maybe you need to have a little bit of help upstream. Maybe we need some big money. It's not a big space you, with, you know, with, 10 billion bucks, which is nothing. <laughs> you could get a lot of these pounds yeah. moving quicker if the government was supported. Um, so I just I just feels like maybe there needs to be a, a different way of looking at this or this yawning gap is going to come perhaps wider than even any of us appreciate because not all these companies will be able to get into production. Not all of them will be able to produce the pounds technically or financially 
it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to start to get quite messy out there, which is great as for uranium investors. If you pick the right companies with strong fundamentals, but, um, and I hope everyone has, you know, as you know, the, the questions come up, for example, where are we in the term contracting cycle? And to their credit, UX says, yeah, there's been an increase in the volumes. We're still early days. Look at this unfilled requirement. You know, I think Cameco published it between now and 2040. It's like 2 billion pounds yet to be put under contract for a fairly modest demand forecast. People don't realize that. That's like, oh, wow, that's significant. That's kind of a mid-level forecast for demand. That isn't your doubling. That isn't your tripling. And and I think I think you've hit the nail on the head, as we would say. The time will come when new approaches have to be looked at. You mentioned a, a buying group. Back in the old days, actually, I was at Portland General Electric. We were part of what was called UOCO. Uranium Ore Buying Company. And it was Philadelphia Electric and several utilities where we were supporting uh, Colorado Plateau miners because you could deliver to White Mesa for processing. They had ore buying stations. That's how White Mesa was originally built. And so we were together. I mean, there was, you know, like three or four utilities funding the ore buying company. Now, it didn't really work out worth, worth a whole lot. But, I mean, so, you know, is it strategic? So we've talked about it. Is it going to be, you know, the Chinese are out kind of running all over. Uh, Brazil, Australia, you know, the Japanese are supposedly out there. Um, do they step in and do they buy several projects? Do they, uh, you know... I think they're in competition, so they're not likely to work together. Let's put it that way. But I think, you know, is it a year? Is it two years where you step back and you go, whoa, we have really seen a major change in this. And, and it's, you know, I mean, it's a spot market. It's, it's you run through the list. It's almost everything should be reexamined. Trying to do things the old way, I'm not sure is going to work very well. So, you know, it's who who decides I got to get out there and do something. Yeah, I was, I was, I was talking to um, a guy, ye- correct, it was yesterday, may, 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 maybe day before, um, and he he's, he's a professor down in, at Missouri um, University, and I think he's, he's, he's basically a professor of um, metallurgical engineering. Okay, that's his thing. But we had a great conversation um, around the state of the nation in the U.S. Right, in terms of you know, you know, is the U.S. doing government doing enough for mining more broadly? This isn't specifically uranium. We were talking, we were talking copper, we we're talking gold, mining generally. And it, short answer, no, absolutely not. And it's because people um, don't understand how long these things take to get up and running. You got to search for it. You got to find it. You got to work out if it's economic. You got to get through all of the kind of environmental components, permitting, licensing, raising money, building the thing, hoping it works. You know, having the skilled labor to be able to do that, um, and then hope that the market is in your favor when you when you are when you're ready to go. You know, because you know, and commodities haven't kind of fallen off the edge of a cliff. So there's a lot of things that need to to, to work perfectly. Um, but but I, but I was sort of I think what he opened my eyes to is the fact that and we will forget about talking about the fact that you know younger people don't like mining and but they want you know mobile phones and, and cars and all of those sorts of things that uh, materials don't you know, dug out of the ground um, allow them to have. But he's saying that government just isn't enabling uh, mining enough yet. It's talking a good game about some of the issues being faced without necessarily kind of stepping up to the plate properly. It, it, you know, words don't mean much. Action means much. Don't tell me, show me. And there's not enough money yet. And he, he very much felt that the government should be supporting mining, which is such an important sector, but because it's such a tiny 
And this is why bankers have the same issue. It's such a small, mining's tiny compared to everything else. I always talk, talk about you combine all the explorers, miners, and producers in, in, the, in the mining sector together in one company. It's not even 50% of the size of Apple, one technology company. That is why it's easy to ignore. But when you start running out of stuff, it becomes a problem. And I think that's there's a big disconnect there. And I think that was his view about certainly the US government's view uh, or approach uh, in the US. And- oh, well, yeah, certainly mining in the US is, is is not viewed positively. And I think the problem is the mining industry, like you say, we could spend a lot of time, doesn't have a voice. American Mining Congress really, you know, coal was a big deal. It's going straight in the dumper. And and so the government, I think what they do is they put out critical mineral reports and they go, hey, we think these are critical minerals, but you guys, we're, we're not going to get involved. We have these other things we do. And, and so, but then when election time comes, we can say, hey, we put out a report that said this is important stuff, but they're not going to, you know. And I think the, the industry is skeptical. When the government steps in, I mean, I hate to say it, well, we're going to budget $2.5 billion for enrichment. It just takes a change in the, the old, the, in, in Washington where the new government goes, no, we're not paying that. That gets to this, was one of the big issues on 232. Remember, the U.S. utilities are going to be required to buy 25% from the U.S. industry, blah, blah, blah. And they kept saying, we need long-term, solid contracts. We're not going to put a dime in based on the government going, you know, yeah, we think so. It's an interesting comment Malcolm Critchley made in London when he was talking about the the WNA market report. I just came across my notes, so that's what I want to say You know, he said, nobody's going to build anything on a demand forecast in this business. We've heard it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's positive. You want to have positive demand forecasts, but you're not going to go, well, here it is. WNA says this is, you know, we're going to need X million. Let's put that billion dollars in and, you know, away we go. It just isn't going to happen. It's got to come from the demand side. They've got to step up and say, we don't like it. Well, okay, but they've been, again, paying artificially low prices set generally by the Russians and the Kazakhs for years. And so to say, nope, now you got to, they, they, it's, a, it's a bad story to take upstairs at a utility. So yeah. they, they don't want to do it yeah. until they have to. Well, I don't, so. I don't blame them. Like you know, and I, and I think it's a widely un, no. widely understood that the you know the the WNA report is it, it does a good job, but perhaps it's not entirely accurate yeah. and representative because it, it can't be. You're you're paid by the people <laughs> you're reporting on. You don't want to say they're perhaps. I don't think they're going to produce as much as they as they say they are. You can't do that. And, and likewise, I had a conversation last week with a. Nickel guy talking about you talk about Wood Mac as a Wood Mac report on nickel, and um, this guy argued because off the back of um, there's a guy called Jim Lennon who sort of trots around China and looks at the the Chinese data, you know, in their own backyard, looking physically at nickel and asking questions, and he's saying that report's about 150 million tons out. Oh, okay. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe that changes the market so much. Do you know, so the, these report. I'm not surprised people don't back one hundred percent. You know, they they don't back the don't put the house on some of these reports because they're an indication of sentiment. I, I would argue the same with some of the lithium reports we were looking at last year, as the market crumbled to to the floor. You know, they were still looking out to the future. Um, which may be the case, but that doesn't help me right now. So, I th- so when it, and when there's money involved, you've got to be just that little bit more careful. I think generally, in, in investing at whatever level. Yeah, I think. But but what what I'm seeing is it's across the board. Yeah. It's trade tech. Yep, it's same. UX. It's Bank of America. It's everybody and his brother that spends some time looking at uranium. Say, hey, you got to produce a whole lot more of this, and it's going to cost a lot more. So I view that as clearly a positive. It's necessary but not sufficient. 
let's put it that beats the days when people are going, yeah, well, this is a goner. Don't waste your money here. So, so I think the sentiment has changed, but then it's like you say, how do you get from here to there? And that's a real challenge. From an, from an equities investor, like we're saying the same thing. I think the, you know, I think the, la- the lack of supply, whether it be nickel, is not as good as people thought. I think what's coming down the line with uranium is going to be not as good as people think. Um, and that's going to be great news for those who do produce or those who you know, can tell a story of how they're going to produce. Um, you know, hopefully that will you know, drive the price, continue to drive these the spot price up and more importantly, turn contracts, contracting up. So yeah, it, it, like, it, as I said, we come full circle. It's like fundamentals <laughs> trump every everyone yeah. and everything in this space. It's you know, spot is not going to change your fortunes. Don't rely on that. It's part of the mix. Cameco being negative, it's not going to necessarily change your fortunes in, in the long run. The fundamentals of the demand and the supply. That's the thing you keep your eye on the macro. So. Um, Dustin, well, there we go. Well, hopefully people like this as much as the last one. They really love what you, where you went with um, the, the last session. Um, so appreciate you coming on again. Good to see you. Safe travels when you're heading back home. Yeah, and very happy to be here. And, you know, Matt, I'm sure we'll talk not the too distant future. And I think things will, again, be very positive. So, but but it's just, and again, the longer it takes, kind of the, the bigger the effect will be. This is not an industry that does anything in a very short term. So, but but we'll see. Positive, positive. Be patient. You will be rewarded. Be patient. Yep. That's my view.